All right, welcome to the Elk Shape YouTube channel Q&A. This is my version of a digital podcast. This is not going to be on iTunes or Stitcher. This is the only place you can get this. This is my way to connect to subscribers and hopefully uh, get people to be more successful in the field when it comes to hunting elk. If you have questions for me that you want me to try to tackle, send those to elkshape at gmail.com. And if I use your question, I'll send you a decal or a hat or an elk-shaped shirt, something, make it worth your while. I always say this, but I'm not an expert. There's so many people out there that are better than I am. I'm just a guy that's hunted for 15 years with a bow. I've made a lot of mistakes, and so I can just give you information based on my experiences. Um, so I'm not an expert, but I do try real hard. I'm an expert in effort. And uh, without further ado, we're going to go into some questions from basically subscribers and I printed off a bunch I don't think we can get through all these I try to keep these fairly short but we're gonna go a little longer with this one today uh, we're gonna highlight two of my partners the first one is boning uh, they make awesome veins for your bow uh, I've always had my full metal jackets tipped with uh, blazers two inch with a three degree offset uh, they make a host of other products that uh, I use you probably use they make everything from string wax to glue uh, to even devices like fletching devices and a whole bunch of other stuff like Knox, etc. So check out Boning, Archery, uh, they're out of Michigan. And then the last one is Mountain Ops, a relatively new company. I've been with them from almost the beginning. Um, Mountain Ops, what can I say about those guys at Mountain Ops? Uh, I could be sponsored by other supplement companies. And I don't say that to impress you, but to impress upon you that I really truly believe in Mountain Ops products. When their line came out, I sampled it and I was really impressed. I left another outdoor supplement company for Mountain Ops and I've never looked back. Uh, the, the ones I take the most on the daily would be Ammo, which is a meal replacement that has no artificial sweetener and all whole foods you have to keep in the refrigerator. We put that in our smoothies and we make pan protein pancakes or waffles with them and uh, or just have it as a meal replacement. The other one I probably like the best is the Enduro, which is kind of a pre-workout, but mainly just a long-lasting vasodilator. And I really like that for sustained energy without a crazy shaking feeling that some of the pre-workouts out there, pre -workouts, uh, supplements can do. So, Mountain Ops, Boning Archery, thank you for your partnership. And let's get into it. First question, it's a long one. This is from Jesse Valdez. What's up, Dan? First off, I've been following you for years now and wanted to say that you're one of the main guys who's inspired me to not only get back into archery, but archery elk. I took about 12 years off from hunting, huge regret, and this previous season was my first archery elk. It's going to be a while until I draw a big bull tag, but until I do, I can hunt spike slash cow in one unit or any legal bull in another unit with low elk density. I did have a couple close encounters with the spike and a couple cows though, just didn't make it happen. I want to get a few bow kills in for the experience of course, the awesome meat in the next couple years. So my question is, what would be the best way to call hunt spikes or cows if presented? Should I even use a call? I learned a ton on my last hunt, found wallows, elk trails, bedding areas, heard bulls bugle, called in a, small, uh, called in a couple five or six points and picked up a few of their patterns and best of all no people in this particular canyon. I'm in Utah with the season beginning about August 20th and running about the second week September. Hope this wasn't too long and no worries. If you don't reply on YouTube, any knowledge from you would be greatly appreciated. Thanks Dan and good luck on future hunts. Hope to hear from you and looking forward to more elk shape videos. Alright, Jesse, cool you're hunting Utah. Uh, obviously you're hunting in um, some limited entry units where they allow just like here in Washington, they'll have a like basically a branched antlered only tag, but you can go in there and shoot a spike or a cow. Excuse me, I'll have some coffee. So, how do you kill a spike? Well, I think opening day is going to be probably one of your best bets. Look, when it comes to spikes specifically, most spikes are not allowed to be in the herd once the rutting starts happening, and you'll see this with your own two eyes as. Um, the rut progresses, the spikes will get kicked out by bigger bulls. Uh, they're just going to get tired of getting their ass kicked. And I would say by, oh, by the end of pre-rut, right into rut, not peak rut, you'll see that there's groups of spikes now. and Or they'll just be by themselves. They've been kicked out. They're still extremely curious. You can call spikes into a cow call or even a small bugle. 
they are very curious animals and if you make mistakes on spikes you can get away with them they they just don't know better they're like a year and a half animal they just don't know a lot and so I do think vocalizations are gonna work well on spikes uh, cows are a little bit trickier especially the lead cow variety are gonna be a pain in your ass um, but first come first serve if you're just trying to get experience and obviously fill your freezer early season August 20th these elk should be semi patternable in open country I would probably do more of intercept or sit trail tree stand wallow um, glass from afar on the fringe and work your way into that kind of hunting I don't think vocalizations are gonna work super good late August uh, but right around that, that last half of your season, you might try cow calling in, um, especially spikes or with a spike bugle. That's worked real well for me. I've killed two spikes in my hunting career. I generally don't pass on any legal elk when I don't have an elk killed. And I'm a trophy elk hunter, but really at the end of the day, I'm an elk meat connoisseur. And so those are some delicious elk steaks. To, it's hard to pass up. But I hope that helps answer your question. I think you're doing the right thing as far as hope, holding out, trying to draw a branched antler tag and, and gaining as much valuable experience as you can. Um, but just be a bi wildlife biologist, Jesse, and try to really understand where the spikes are gonna be and how they're gonna uh, interact with the herd once the bigger boys start taking over. Um, you'll also see spikes join back up with the herds once the bulls pull off towards a post-rut phase or whatever. But find those groups of spikes intercept those cows and I hope that helps answer your question we're gonna keep it brief and move on to the next one Matthew Gray says I love the Q&A videos I'm from Texas I've hunted whitetails for almost 20 years and went on my first western hunt this year do it yourself over the counter Colorado archery and got a bull with the help of your YouTube channel so thank you for all the tips and videos that's badass I love game meat and my wife likes it too but most of the recipes I have for game meat tend to be time consuming or a lot of work. So if we eat my elk or whitetail, it's generally only when I cook it. I have also bought some books with game recipes, but most of them are extensive and require lots of ingredients. I'm having trouble finding everyday type meals using game meat for regular busy family with kids. My question is, what are your, some of your favorite meals your family likes to have with your game meat? What is your favorite, your wife's favorite, your kids? Easiest, quickest meal on a busy weekday. Thank you for your videos. Can't get enough. Keep them coming. All right. Matthew. Man, I don't think wild game is any harder to cook than any other meat. I really don't. Um, in fact, right now we have back straps in the sink. They're frozen and they're unthawing. And when my wife gets home today, she's going to probably marinate them for a couple hours. And then we'll just sear them on the grill outside. Easy peasy. Uh, don't overcook your wild game meat. Don't undercook it, obviously. Find some seasonings that work for you. Johnny's makes a wild game seasoning. If you haven't seen that, that's pretty sweet. Um, but we do crock pot stuff for stews and roasts, which is very convenient during the week, especially when mom and dad work. Is It's just you know 30 minutes in the morning, cutting up your veggies or potatoes or whatever to make your stew or getting your pot roast uh, prepared and adding the water. So crock pot is your best friend for wild game, for people that work, because then it's your house is going to smell so good when you come home and you're going to have some delicious meals. So we do a lot of crock pot stews. We also do a lot of burger for taco meat or taco salads, um, some spaghetti squash, like, you know, spaghetti meat. And that's really easy to cook. It's just as fast as anything else you've ever seen. And then steaks are just grilled. So I really don't... I think you need a new mindset, find some recipes that work good for you. We don't have time to go over a cooking show, but we, we do the crock pot, we do the steaks, we do the burger, and we make burgers, taco meat, spaghetti meat, and it doesn't take long at all. And we don't eat wild game every night, you know, we don't, but we eat a lot. And um, just work with your spouse, take something out of the freezer the night before or the morning of, and um, use your marinate, marinate the crap out of it or use your rubs or whatever, but crock pot's probably our best bet for preparing meals in bulk. All right, Mark Nara. Hey Dan, thanks for what you do. I have no idea how you manage a family, business, and hunt like you do. I admire that greatly. Let me interrupt. I wanna go off on a tangent, but look, if you wanna be successful at elk hunting, you need to do a couple things for yourself. If you think you're gonna kill an elk by 
so let's say you get you're an average Joe, you work 40 hours a week, you get two lousy weeks of vacation a year. Do you really think your wife's going to let you spend both those weeks just hunting and no vacations with her? Maybe. Your wife's cool if she does, but my wife, no. Not going to happen. So if you want to be a really successful bow hunter or hunter, period, this is a decision I had to make. You need to become self-employed. Seriously. Uh, think about it if, you, if it's on your radar entrepreneurship, but being self-employed is the reason why I hunt as much as I do. You have to make a cognizant decision. Like you have to say, you know what? I'm not really interested in becoming a millionaire. I just want to pay my bills, save some money for retirement, and you know, raise my family and give them what they need. And that should allow you to work, but also have time to play. And that's that's where my life is at. My priorities is when I was 27, I went in for business myself. Before that. I think I quit three or four jobs September 1st only to get hired at another place October 1st so I could hunt all of September. That's not a good recipe either and I know many of you might have done the same thing but quitting one job so you can have a month off or maybe you have a job where you're laid off during the fall, that's a good way to go or maybe you're a fireman and you work two days on, four days off and you trade shifts so you have a whole month off. I know guys like that, they hunt a lot but the guys that hunt the most are usually self-employed have a business that they set up and it runs on its own and they can maybe come into town every five to ten days, check a few emails, put out a few fires. But if you want to be successful hunting, you have to be able to have the time. It's going to be really challenging if you get two weeks off a year and that ends up being a ten day hunt where you have one weekend, five week weekdays and one weekend and that's your hunting season. It's going to be tough. You can do it. Um, but sacrificing for hunting is more of a lifestyle choice. I didn't really want to go on a tangent but I've always wanted to bring that up. that. I'm not the world's greatest hunter, but I do spend a lot of time hunting and I've made a decision, a life decision. That's the, that's just the way I want to roll. Life short, don't care about retiring when I'm 40. Um, I have a specific hunting budget. I have a specific amount of hours or days, that weeks that I can hunt a year and that's where my priorities are at. All right, background on Mark is he 37 years old, lives in Columbus, Ohio. He had one failed bow hunt in 2015 in Colorado with a group of guys that were less than prepared. Can you walk through what you do recommend on an out-of-state solo backpack hunt from a complete logistical standpoint? This is this to me is the largest mental barrier, including how you choose your camp strategy, base camp, bivy, spike. Do you combine these strategies? Moving around units effectively to find game and packing the meat out and getting it back home. Some obvious questions include, do you use a pickup truck or an RV? Do you use a motorbike ATV to scout the unit? Do you hire a packer to assist? An elk is huge, I'm 5'8", 155, feel free to tell me to lift more. <laughs> How do you preserve game for the trip home? Chest freezer, power, inverter, cooler. How do you hunt safely solo? What are your biggest mistakes when you've hunted out of state? Thanks again. Best of luck with your channel. Oh my gosh, I feel like this is the last question because there's so much here to cover. All right, let's let's rewind. It's January first, which when this video will probably be in, it's January. Wyoming comes out with um, their hunting application process for elk. Um, Wyoming's pain in my ass for a couple of reasons. A lot of their good hunts don't require very many points. They take your first choice, uh, and that's where your preference points come into play. I think the max preference points this year for elk is ten. I know this because I'm at nine. Um, and then they don't even set their actual dates until like May. So you could draw something, but it's not really, uh, don't even get me started. But Wyoming comes out January, Arizona comes out in February, and then you start to see Nevada, and then you see Colorado, and then you start to see Utah. Actually, Utah's in February. There's just, you need to start planning your hunt in January, and you need to start putting in for all these states if you're going to hunt out of state. Uh, I live in the West and I still get excited about leaving Washington for many reasons. But one of my goals is to kill a bull in every state out West and I just like the experience of hunting new places, seeing new country um, and there's a lot that goes into hunting out of state. I'm going to go through my last year, like I said I killed three bulls last year. I've done that before in a season um, but this year it was spread out pretty good. So. My last hunt was in Arizona. It was a late season, low odd success rate hunt. And there's a reason why, because it's really hard with a bow 
when they're not bugling and the wind swirls and the wind swirls and swirls and swirls. You can see bulls, but getting in on them, it's loud, it's rocky, it's crunchy. Um, and they usually end up smelling you before anything. But uh, I had so many unsuccessful stocks there. But I knew I was going down to Arizona. I had an opportunity to go with friends. I chose to go solo. I like to hunt solo for a lot of reasons, but mainly because if I succeed or fail, it's on my shoulders. I'm not limited to one truck, one four-wheeler, or one dirt bike, or one camper, or one base camp. If I don't like where I'm at, I will pick up and move. So when I hunt out of state, one of the things I, I want to do is set myself up to be mobile. And that doesn't necessarily mean just in the backcountry mobile. That means like, okay, this area sucks, or it's got a lot of pressure, or I'm not seeing elk. Put Break down my camp in 20 minutes, throw it in the back of the truck, drive 20, 30 miles another part of the unit and go hunt. Especially if you've never had boots on the ground. So I think the first thing to answer you is when you're going out of state, set yourself up where you have a portable base camp uh, that can be, basically you don't have to set up a wall tent. It doesn't take a half day to get everything set up. Uh, I like to do just a small tent or a TP tent with a cot, a cooler, a small portable table, archery target, with all my food. And if I don't like it, throw in the back of the truck, 20 minutes, I'm gone, and I'm checking out a new area. And that's cool. That's, you know, Randy Newberg always says, and I stole this from him, he's like, take the first three days. First day one, you're in a new unit, you wanna, you wanna just kinda try to figure it out. And you have six or seven places that you've studied on Google Earth that you wanted to check out. So you're gonna try to check all those places out in three days. So you start figuring it out. Start crossing things off your list. Not gonna go there, uh, this place sucked. This place looks good, had great sign. I heard a bugle there. Day two, you start to sort it out, and those kind of blend a little bit, but you're figuring and sorting, and by day three, you should have a good plan of where some elk are at, and you kind of know what they're doing. And so I still I steal that from him, and I think that's a great approach for out of state. So again, it comes back to internet scouting, Google Earth, forum, forum searching, and just get as much information while you can't be there in person. And then when you're there, you get to work and you have a mobile base camp and you go start going to all your places and figuring them out. Uh, yeah, so as far as um, what I, I usually drive uh, a Tacoma or a Tundra with a dirt bike in the back is my preference. I do have a four wheeler, but I prefer dirt bikes over four wheelers for many reasons. I like places that you can hunt with a single track dirt bike trail so four wheelers can't get in there. There's not a lot of places like that, but if you can find them, those are sweet, especially if it's very technical dirt bike trail stuff. That'll keep a lot of people out. And um, a dirt bike doesn't take that much room. You can still fit everything in the back of the truck without having to haul a trailer. Um, if I am going to take a trailer, I'll load the four-wheeler up. Um, and then when I get to where I'm going, I start checking out all my hunches of where where people are at, how many trucks are parked at which trailhead, and you have to be... You have to adapt and overcome. So that's your first part is being a mobile camp, deciding, you know, yeah, I hunt off a dirt bike or a four-wheeler or even a mountain bike. Figure out what's going to be your best or have all three at your arsenal. Um, I don't use an RV. My dad has a sweet little fifth wheel. We have used it from time to time, but I don't think it's necessary, especially if you're driving a long ways, like you're from Columbus, Ohio. I don't think you want to spend the extra gas to haul that extra weight. Do I hire a packer to assist? Um, on an elk recovery. Well, I'm 5'7 and 155 pounds. I never have hired a packer to, to pick, take an elk out, but I'm not against it. There's a couple places in Washington, Wyoming, where if I kill a bull, I have the number, I contacted, and I have contacted the packer in advance, find out their rate, make sure they can get into that country um, because they don't want to lose elk meat. So I think it's important to have a packer lined up just in case or have two or three because if you could have one and they could be busy for two days taking somebody's elk out um, or doing a drop camp they you know they do several different things for their revenue so you need to have two or three packers on the line plugged into your phone ready to go don't spend more than two or three hundred bucks to get an elk out in my opinion if they're like a lot of them will say it's 150 bucks an animal well okay let's say I kill a bull in the backcountry I have my entire bivy camp or spike camp to take out plus I need to meet the packer cell phone service where can we meet get them at that spot 
let's have them bring their horse and one extra horse. We should be able to get almost the entire elk out and whatever they can't get, I'm gonna take out with me or with my partner. So that's why I say 300 bucks is kind of my threshold, 150 bucks a head for the animal. Uh, no more than that, that should be fine. Um, these are great questions. How do you preserve game meat for the trip home? So when I went to Arizona, what I did in advance is I took, I had four coolers and for the, the month leading up to that hunt, anytime we finished a gallon of milk at home, I rinsed it out thoroughly and put good clean drinking water in there and then put it in the freezer. So I went down to Arizona with I think eight gallons of frozen jugs spread out through all my coolers. Um, and then I, when, as the water slowly melted, I'd use that for drinking or cooking water. And I was there for eight days, and when I left home with my elk, I had it in quarters. These are big coolers. And I still had plenty of ice to keep it cold. And then what I did was I, I put a little bit of cardboard on the bottom, or dry ice on the bottom from Walmart. I spent like 25 bucks on dry ice, and then I put cardboard over that so it didn't burn the, didn't burn the meat. And then I put the, the uh, quarters on top, and I had the jugs of ice in there. I don't have a Yeti or an Orion cooler yet. Um, I want to get sponsored by one of those guys because I don't want to spend 500 bucks on a cooler. Not going to happen. But uh, if I ever get a partnership going, you bet. But right now, I'm just using, you know, your typical coolers that anybody would get for a reasonable price, and they're not as good. So, but with the with the gallons, that would seem to work well. And I never ran out of water either. So something to think about doing that. Do you hunt safely solo? I like to think so. Um, there's very few places I've hunted where I don't get some cell phone service or I don't try to get a text out to my wife to let her know I'm okay. Um, and if I am going to be in an area where I'm not going to reach out to them, I'll let them know before I leave. If you don't hear from me by X, you need to be concerned. But I feel very safe hunting solo and it's taken just, it's an evolution over many, many years of hunting by myself. I've hunted in Alaska by myself. One of my, when I was 21, I got dropped off and killed my very first caribou with a bow in 2005. That was a solo drop off hunt and looking back, it might have been kind of dumb, but you know, God was looking out for me. It worked out fine, but I really prefer solo hunting a lot of the times just because you make all the decisions, it's all on your shoulders and um, the outcome is solely your responsibility and you're not limited to someone else's opinion or of you should go high or go low or we should stay here in glass or we should drop after them or we should move here. I like making all the decisions myself. Um, what are my biggest mistakes I've hunted out of state? Um, not knowing the game regs entirely can get you into trouble. Some states require proof of sex attached to the quarter or to the carcass, or some states just having the antlers, um, attaching the tag to the biggest portion of the meat, not on the antlers. Every state has their own little rules, which some states allow mechanicals, some don't, although I do not use mechanicals at all. Some states allow lighted knocks, some don't. Um, some states require an archery stamp, others do not. So I think the biggest mistake people might make is just being ignorant to those specific rules for that state. You owe it to everybody, as far as all of us hunters, to represent us well and be knowledgeable and educated upon each state's proclamations, rules, laws, regulations. Um, and you just gotta be diligent and read through and just know your laws. That's important. Um, other mistakes I've made while hunting out of state, gosh, um, probably not willing to be mobile like I was talking about. You know, the first time I hunted Arizona, I stuck to a pretty small area. And this last year when I was down there, dude, I traveled, I covered the whole dang unit and I never was married to one spot. And I think that's why I was successful. And I just got away from pressure and I finally found some unmolested elk and I found an area where it didn't swirl as bad and I was able to successfully make my stock on that bull. Um, I also hunted in Idaho for out of state. I'm a Washington resident and I killed two bulls there. Um, that to me is a place, and I've, I mentioned this in videos before and I'm gonna end with this, is that if you can find a place that's got good elk density, fairly light hunting pressure, 
and you can get an over-the-counter tag year after year and go back and go back, you are really going to start doing yourself a favor by learning the intricacies of each hunting area. You're going to learn the prevailing winds, where the elk like to go, where the wind likes to swirl, where they like to bed, where they like to feed, when they like to rut, when the peak rut usually is. And the more knowledge you have of a specific area, the deadlier you're going to be. End of story. In fact, drawing a premium limited entry tag where the bull to cow ratio is 50 to 100 and you know you you have a trophy potential of 330 plus, you could get there and not know the unit and you could spend most of your time trying to figure it out. One year I drew a premium limited entry Washington elk tag and I scouted three or four different times and I got there and the unit was on fire where I was hunting and I had was forced to hunt somewhere I didn't even scout and it took me 11 days to kill a bull and it was hard as I think it might have been harder than some of the general season tags just trying to find elk and get in on them I did kill my biggest bull to date there but it was 11 days grind so don't overlook over-the-counter tags, general season stuff that you can hunt year after year and gain valuable knowledge. But I recommend definitely like look into going solo. Look early on in the draws. Do your research. Uh, I'm a member of GoHunt.com. I pay the price, and I think that's a really awesome research tool. Um, study your maps. Geek out on Google Earth. Comb the internet. Hunting forums. Direct message some people on social media. You'll never know what you get there. Get boots on the ground if you can. Have a mobile camp. Have seven to ten places you want to check out in the unit. Pull Randy Newberg and figure it out, sort it out, and then go hunt it. And just come in there with an open mind and have several tactics available as far as hunting from a base camp, hunting from a spike camp, and even baby hunting. But most importantly, show up in great shape. I would say I'm going to end on all my hunts are, that are successful have a direct correlation to the fact that I'm not the world's best elk hunter. I'm not the great archery shot that maybe some of you think. I'm not bad, but I'm physically and mentally tough as anyone you will meet because I do not get tired, I do not need sleep, and I will not give up. I will hunt the first day as hard as I will hunt the last day of my hunt. I will never sleep in. Sleep. I will sleep when I'm dead because hunting is such a limited finite number of hours so physical and mental conditioning is my number one asset and that's what elk shape is all about and so with the new year coming up you might really you know look at your own personal fitness and nutrition habits and think about the bigger picture can you honestly say that your number one asset isn't your hunting skills or your shooting skills but it's your physical and mental toughness are you doing something uncomfortable every day in the name of mental toughness I am. I'm sweating every day. I'm doing grueling workouts every day. I am disciplined at shooting my bow several times a week, creating strong muscle memory. And I do it all in the name of elk hunting. And I can't wait for next fall. And it keeps me going all year long. So thanks for watching. This is a longer one. Send your questions to elkshape at gmail.com. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one.